good morning good afternoon and good evening everyone i am anand ganu founder president of garje marathi global incorporated a non profit registered in state of california and garje marathi global foundation a non profit sectioned company registered in india garje marathi global is a platform for non resident marathi and back to motherland marathi who value knowledge education and entrepreneurship garje marathi has four main objectives which are networking mentoring giving back to society and to our roots and to celebrate success of fellow marathis around the world today garje marathi is on the path of becoming truly global having gmg chapters in more than 30 countries around the world today's webinar is going to be a real learning experience for all of us i welcome today's invited speaker steve hoffman steve is the ceo of founder space one of the world's leading startup incubators and accelerators founder space is ranked top 10 in forbes magazine and entrepreneur magazine moderator for today's event is the person who is instrumental in organizing this event who is also who also mentors and leads garje marathi innovation academy mr sudhir kadam sudhir kadam is a silicon valley entrepreneur investor and a startup advisor with five successful exits he works with early early stage and growth stage startup companies in us europe and asia to help them to scale grow into a thriving business with a game changing solutions his focus areas are growth acceleration go to market customer success partnerships customer success partnership operational excellence funding and exit strategy his current portfolio companies of the startups are in ai nlp for e-commerce body motion virtualization like ar vr cv medical devices visual ai and medical imaging i iot for industry 4.0 mobile payments travel experiences and digital signature sudhir says i am now in a mode of helping entrepreneurs to succeed in their ventures with my advice and guidance i invite sudhir to talk about today's event and to give detailed introduction of today's invited speaker steve hoffman sudhir now i request you to take the controls of today's proceeding Over to Sudhir. Thank you, thank Sudhir. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, thank you for this opportunity and welcome everybody. Good day, everyone. Garja Marathi's uh, Innovation Academy, uh, which I'm part of, is preparing to announce its first acceleration program this month. Okay, so this session is a very fitting warm-up as our coaches and mentors prepare to accompany the aspiring founders on their roller coaster journey. This session will be a combination of a fireside chat, a presentation. followed by audience q and a so ask your questions by typing in the chat message uh, so so much for the housekeeping let's get to the main event it's an honor for me to introduce a dear friend and an iconic figure in the world of innovation steve hoffman uh, we call him captain hoff in silicon valley steve is the chairman and ceo of founder space a leading incubator and accelerator headquartered in san francisco with worldwide presence is also an angel investor serial entrepreneur educator mentor and an innovator so instead of my rattling out and doing a monologue to introduce steve let's hear it from him steve unlike many startups founders of silicon valley you come from the world of hollywood tell us about that journey thank you well first of all it is wonderful to be here and to meet all of you and thank you for having me i did i actually have multiple degrees so i have a degree in electrical computer engineering uh and then i have a graduate degree in film and television production so i went to usc for graduate school and that has guided my path in life i actually began by working in hollywood developing television shows i was a, te a television development executive at a company called freeze entertainment which produced hundreds of movies and TV shows and that was a fantastic experience for me to go deep on the entertainment business while i was there i met the founder of sega one of the large gaming companies at the time it was the largest in the world it had just surpassed nintendo and uh, i the founder is an american but the company <clears throat> is japanese and he wanted to bring over somebody from hollywood to help guide them in their future entertainment strategy. So, I said, why not? You know, I believe interactive entertainment is going to surpass traditional entertainment. 
And at the time it wasn't, um, but soon enough it did. And I took the leap across the ocean. I uh, lived in Japan. I worked out of their headquarters. And then I got the itch to start my own company, to be an entrepreneur, like so many of you out there. And I returned to California, my home, and set up operations in Silicon Valley and launched my first startup, which was a gaming startup coming out of Sega. It was natural that I should choose this. And it combined technology and entertainment. And the company did extremely well. Uh, our first product was Gazillionaire, a game that actually teaches uh, people to become entrepreneurs uh, in a really fun, interactive way. And that is still available today. Like it's still selling years and years later on Steam. Uh, so uh, I, we went on from Gazillionaire to launch a whole series of products, which were used in hundreds of schools uh, uh, around the world, millions of players. And then I launched an, a new company called Spider Dance, which did interactive television shows. And we signed up uh, most of the major networks, you know, uh, Warner Brothers, Viacom, uh, Turner Broadcasting, NBC, you know, all these major television networks in Hollywood signed up with us and we ran interactive shows for them. I went on to do two other venture funded startups, kind of crossing the lines between uh, entertainment and technology, always bridging that gap. After my third venture funded startup, I decided to take a break because, you know, doing a startup is a lot of work. Uh, but all my friends came to me and they were like, Steve, Steve, can you help us? We're doing a company. We need to raise money. We need to raise, you know, how do we go about writing our business plan? How do we approach investors? How do we structure our company? All the questions entrepreneurs have. And so I started to answer these questions for my friends. And then I thought, well, other people could benefit from my answers. So I put up a blog and I called it founderspace.com. Uh, and founderspace.com actually- This is the tunnel, this is the water, and that's the boat. And that's the baby. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, well, that was cute, very cute. Um, so we launched Founderspace um, and we, uh, we grew uh, from an organization helping entrepreneurs in a small way to a global startup incubator and accelerator. So we have partners all over the world today. Uh, we are very active. Uh, prior to the pandemic, I spent over half my time traveling. And actually I made a commitment because I the real strength of Founder Space is its global reach and my dedication to bridging uh, cultures and businesses across borders. I wanna bring people together, that is my mission. And that's why it's wonderful to talk to this group today uh, from people all over the world. So I will be traveling 100% of my time. I literally just gave up my home. I got vaccinated and I am going to be traveling uh, first across the US uh, to work with partners and, and meet companies in all the different cities. And then I will travel probably to Europe and after that to Asia. And uh, so I hope to meet many of you on my travels. And if you uh, are doing something interesting, if there's a conference or if a program you want me to participate in, uh, go to Founders Space right up there and just contact me. They'll forward it to me if you put my name in there. So, um, and we can arrange uh, as I go. You know, I will go wherever uh, opportunity raises its hand. That's sort of my motto. So let me begin with the presentation today and it's so, so Steve, before you go yes. to the presentation, you yes. know, I think uh, we wanted, I wanted to bring up uh, some discussion on the innovation part of mm -hmm. it, because I think you were one of the early ones to educate corporate executives on the art of innovation with, and you brought up the concept of startup corporate management. Mm. Okay. So you've trained, uh, tell us more about that. Yes. Yeah, so I've spent a lot of time working with major corporations around the world. So working with companies like Qualcomm, Bosch, the big auto parts maker, uh, Huawei. I did a lot of work with Huawei. Uh, you know, Hire, the big Chinese company, uh, Microsoft, you name it. I've worked with these huge corporations. And what, what I've done is I have been, we have been running programs that parallel our startup incubator and accelerator programs. So we have been running corporate innovation programs. 
And the corporate innovation programs have three different pieces. So they have a piece where we take internal teams, entrepreneurs inside the corporations, and we actually take them through a similar process, although it's adapted, that startup founders go through in actually generating, validating, and launching products. So the whole cycle. And we, we've run these around the world. And they've been very successful. They've actually been great ways uh, for us and the corporations to learn what works inside their organization. And every organization is different. We also have done programs where we actually take our talent pool and we design early prototypes for corporations of new products. So we've come up with like visions of products that will come out, you know, for example, in Huawei in the future, like in different areas like brain computer interfaces, you know, consumer uh, electronics, all of these. And then, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, while, while you're talking about this innovation, you know, I wanted to bring up discussion on your other book, uh, Make Elephants Fly. I believe this book was published in 2017. And this was uh, particularly touching on the topic of radical innovation mm. and aimed at making corporations dance on the innovation floor like nimble and agile startups. Tell us about that. Yes. Book. So Make Elephants Fly is all about how you manage innovation teams inside a corporation and the parallels to how successful startups around the world uh, who I've worked with personally manage their innovation process. And a few things I learned that are really, really interesting is that a lot of corporations approach it backwards. They, they start with like a contest for who has the best idea. And I will tell you, this is fraught with problems. Like you do not want to choose the best idea when you are innovating. People are like, what? <laughs> like, don't choose the best idea? Are, are you crazy? Um, and the problem is what sounds like the best idea for innovating in a corporation is what, you know, people who have no data, if it's a new idea, if it's a breakthrough idea, it means it's, it's new. You don't have a lot of data. You don't really understand what you're doing. And the idea will probably be full of holes that you don't see. So usually in a corporation, they get executives who are pretty conservative, a lot of them, and they will pick the winners and then they will run with these ideas. And either they're not really that innovative, they're just kind of an extension of what they're doing already, or uh, they, don't, they don't really understand what they're choosing and they're passing over a lot of great ideas and they're picking one. And once they pick one, they get locked in. So I've had corporate innovation teams come to me and we, I go, okay, let's validate this idea. We go into the marketplace. We find out the customers aren't that interested. They don't really care about this product. You know, only it was chosen. And I go to them and I say, well, you have to change direction right away. We're wasting time and money. We don't want to focus on this. They're like, we can't. What do you mean? Well, we were selected as the winner. We have to do this. And my boss, my boss sold it to his boss who sold it to her boss and so on and up the corporate ladder. And we're, so they can't change. So they're locked in to a bad idea. So I tell corporations in a nutshell, choose the team and let them try, have them focus on an area you want to innovate in and try a lot of ideas. Like you don't know which one is best until you're much further down the path. So the people are what matters. And a lot of times the winner who came up with the idea that was chosen isn't even really a natural entrepreneur or entrepreneur. They aren't gifted at that. So that I could go on forever. It's a whole right, book. Right, right. No, <laughs> no, I, Steve, I, I remember your line in the book, innovation is no longer an option. It's the prize of admission into the business world, you know? Yes. And that was, that was my carry home from that book. Okay, now switching gears and turning to your new book, Surviving a Startup. I believe Trim Dripper tells founders that this book could save you much of emotional turmoil. Okay, so can you, can you, can you now get to your presentation you know, and tell us uh, what are the lessons in your book that could help the aspiring entrepreneurs? Sure, so I will uh, go into a PowerPoint and show you so, uh, a little about my book. I, I'm not gonna go through all the ideas. Actually, yeah. the book is, has, it's packed. Like I took, uh, I've been doing this for 20 years. So it's like 20 years of experience and knowledge into, a, a book that isn't that long. So I will just highlight a few different points and I'll share my screen. So hold with me for a moment. Share. Okay. Yeah, we can see the screen. 
I know I'm going to duplicate so you get full screen. Okay. Ignore the Chinese, uh, but Founder Space has a lot of business in China. So uh, I often have Chinese subtitles. Uh, we have incubators in Shenzhen, Hangzhou, Nanjing, Xi'an, Wuhan, and other cities. So I'm always flying back and forth. Uh, that's why there's Chinese. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, like your organization, we have over uh, 50 partners in 22 countries. So we're very global. Um, we work all across Europe and all across Asia, and I love it uh, because I just love engaging with really bright minds and people who are passionate about what they do and people who want to do good things. So who really want to change the world for the better. So uh, that is my joy, and I feel so fortunate to be able to do that. We also, as you mentioned, we received very high rankings from Forbes and Entrepreneur magazines, especially we were ranked number one in the category of best overseas accelerators. So global accelerators, that's kind of been our niche. There are many other good uh, accelerators like Y Combinator and 500 Startups. So there are many other good ones. Uh, my two books that we just mentioned, Make Elephants Fly, which really focuses on innovation and Surviving a Startup, which focuses on entrepreneurship. And Today, I'm gonna to talk about a few ideas. I call it the Startup Survival Guide. So these are a few takeaways that you can have when you're doing a startup, things to think deeply about. Number one is it's really important for entrepreneurs to understand going into it that it's not easy. If you, you know, we read all these news articles and blogs about the overnight unicorns and they make it seem so simple. Like there's, you just, Start, you just register a domain name and instantly you're, you're a gazillionaire, you're incredibly rich. Um, but they leave out all the hard part and for every success they highlight, there are hundreds of failures. I mean, literally, you know, 90% of startups fail. That's just a fact, Those, that's where the numbers are. And, you know, of the 10% that make it, very few, a small fraction become the type we read about become the next you know, clubhouse that we're all talking about today, you know, or Instagram or whatever it is. So uh, you entrepreneurs need to understand that when they're going into this, they have to go into it for the long haul because study after study says that the one thing that defines success more than any other trait a person will have is whether they have stamina, whether they can stick with it and really keep working even when you know, they get beaten down over and over. So the other thing I tell entrepreneurs is it's important not to fear death. Like if you are worried that your startup is gonna die, that you will fail, then what you naturally do is you start to limit risk. You start not to take chances. But it, the more you limit risk, you're actually the greater your chance of not becoming a unicorn is. You, you could run maybe a, a small business limiting risk, but if you're gonna grow into the next Tesla or SpaceX, you've gotta think huge. You've gotta take enormous chances. Like Elon Musk and SpaceX didn't say, well, we're gonna try to get satellites into space. He didn't say that. Elon Musk said, we're going to Mars. And then how much bigger risk can you take? <laughs> like that is an insane idea. Now it seems actually doable. But when he said this years ago, it seemed nuts because every single scientist, everything I could read online said it was impossible to start a colony of humans on Mars anytime within the next hundred years. Now the jury's still out. We don't know if some of those scientists might be right, but that's not stopping Elon Musk from trying. So that's my, my tell you, take the risk. If you're doing venture funded startups, you have to do it. Don't fool yourself. You know, too many entrepreneurs drink their own Kool-Aid. They, it's so, um, all of us are passionate. Like I'm passionate, you can tell I'm passionate about everything I do. When I did my companies, I was passionate. When I help entrepreneurs, I'm passionate. Uh, we're all passionate. We all really care about what we're doing. And you know, the reason most startups fail is not due to a lack of passion. It's because they love their company and their product too much. And you know what they say in the real world? Love is blind. Like, you know, you can be uh, dating someone and you've, you're infatuated. You think this person is incredible. 
and your friends and your family might say, that person isn't right for you. Can't you see it? But you can't because you're in love with it. So most entrepreneurs I see, they wind up fooling themselves. They wind up believing that their product is, is really what the customer wants, despite what the customers and the feedback they are getting. They ignore the feedback. They put on blinders. So they, they do not see what's in front of them. And then they end up driving their startup straight off a cliff because they keep, they have the stamina, they have the endurance, they, they, they will not give up and they are in love with their product. So they just keep going in the same direction, even though it's not working. That's why they fail. Really good entrepreneur, really amazing entrepreneurs change direction all the time. They are always uh, shifting where they're going to go. And this is essential with your business. You don't innovate by going in a straight line. You innovate by making constant changes, adjusting according to the data coming in. There's, the further you go, the more information you're gathering. And you need to see that information for what it really is if you're going to guide your company in the right direction and eventually come out successful. Ask for help. A lot of entrepreneurs are independent. Otherwise, they wouldn't be entrepreneurs. They'd be working for a big corporation, but they have this independent spirit. They want to do it on their own. And a lot of the time, uh, they uh, refuse to get the help they need. My thing is the really, really smart entrepreneurs out there, they actually are constantly tapping other people outside their company and asking them for opinions because uh, they, you know, we all get myopic. We can only, you know, we get focused on what we're doing and it's really important to get an outside perspective. This can be, come from mentors. It could come from a startup accelerator. It could come from investors. It could come from family. Um, and most importantly, from advisors, bringing in really qualified outside advisors and being totally honest with them, telling them all the, not candy coating it, showing them what your company really is doing. Bon Excuse me? Okay. <laughs> what your company is really doing, what problems you are really having, and getting that honest feedback. But in order to get honest feedback, you have to give them permission. People will tell you what you want to hear if they, uh, and if you tell, if they think you're not going to take honest feedback, you, most people will not give it to you. They will just like nod, say it's okay. But you have to say, look, I want you to tell me what you actually think. What's actually in your head when you look at our product, when you go to customers? What's actu what are actually, um, what direction should we take? What mistakes do you see that we're making? What opportunities are we overlooking? That is critical. Get your team on board. I owe, one thing I like to say is no matter how talented you are, no matter how great an entrepreneur you are, you, no one person ever builds a big business alone. If you want to build a unicorn, a billion dollar company, you can't do it by yourself. So it's absolutely essential to, first of all, get a great team, like an amazing team of people that complement your skills and get them invested in the project, in your company. So this, uh, this is critical. There are different management styles, but the one that's been proven most effective, especially for innovation companies, not for a factory where you have a you know, where everything's run routinely, everybody knows their role and they go out and they're on an assembly line. You can run that in a very hierarchical manner. But if you really want to innovate like we do in Silicon Valley, it's really important to give ownership to your team. And that means not managing everything they do, giving them uh, the permission and authority to speak up and experiment Try things that maybe you think are stupid ideas, right? Or maybe you don't understand, but, be, but they may see something you don't. And if you really want them to turn their brain on, you need to let them go in those, go after those. You can't keep them locked up in, 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 and, and completely under your control. So I have a rule when managing, and it's a golden rule. It's called ask, don't tell. When you are managing your team, if you want them to be on board, if you want them to really uh, give it their all, instead of walking up to them every day and telling them, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this, ask them. Ask them what they think they should be doing. 
they know where, if you're a good manager, they know the direction your company is headed. They know your mission. And it, by asking them, you turn their brain on. They have to think for themselves. They can't wait for you to tell them what to do. They need to come, they need to, uh, come up with the answers. And as soon as they come up with the answers, they are invested in the process. They are invested in the direction the company is taking. So it's absolutely critical um, to do this for innovation companies. And I want to challenge you, all of you out there, if you're a manager in your company for one week, just one week, try not to tell anybody in your company what to do. It's really hard. It's like extremely hard because you're used to telling people, especially if you're the boss, but try just asking them. But you can get them to do everything with good questions. Uh, what, you know, what are you going to do next uh, to hit our goal? What are you going to do? Then they would tell you. And then if you don't think it's a good idea, you don't have to say, oh, that's a bad idea. Do this. You say, why did you make that decision? Uh, 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 have you considered other ideas? Are there other approaches? You know, just ask. And you may learn something that you didn't know. They may have an idea in their head that they haven't ex fully expressed or even thought about. But through that dialogue, you are getting the best out of your employees. Speaking of the best, only the best survive. So if, you know, a lot of, I'm a venture capitalist, a lot of entrepreneurs come up and pitch me all the time for funding. And some of them I'll say, well, there's these other companies out there, these other competitors, are you gonna beat them? Are you gonna be bigger than them? A lot of them will be honest and they will say, you know, uh, We'll, we're happy to be second or third. You know, we don't have to be number one. Well, I will tell you, in the world today, it, yes, with technology and network effects, if you aren't number one, you are almost surely dead. You, I mean, I usually walk away from companies if they don't believe they can be number one, if they can't clearly articulate to me why they can be number one. Because we all know that you know, there's Google, the big search engine, and then, you know, what other search engines out there? there you know, there are a few, but they get hardly a, a fraction of the traffic of Google. And this uh, network effect and, the, and the, the ease of which it is to scale technology and put it out there means that if they tell you they're not going to be number one, if they say number two or three, you can be sure they're not going to be two or three. They're going to be nine, 10, 11. They're going to be way down the list because there's more than one company saying that they are sure they can be number one. So there's only going to be one number one. And maybe one of the other companies that was so sure it would be number one, they might be number two. So, uh, you know, in your company, I have a rule of thumb. If you aren't going to be the best, if you do not absolutely believe that you have something special to offer that nobody else is offering and that you can pass up all your competitors with this, then switch your idea now. Switch today. Don't stick with it. Share future profits. You know, money is tight. I get this all the time. Entrepreneurs come up to me and, and they, they, they are like my nickname is Captain Hoff in Silicon Valley. People call me Captain, I'm Captain of Founders Space. So they like, Captain, you know, I can't afford to hire good people. I can't afford to do deals. I can't, you know, I'm telling them, you know, you don't have to give away all your equity. You can share future profits. So there are many ways to structure things through commissions, uh, through long-term profit sharing partnerships, uh, through, of course, you, you can give away equity, but you need to use these other tools at the beginning to motivate partners to get on. And don't be greedy. Like, honestly, if this company grows into a unicorn, you're going to have more than enough. Too many uh, startup founders I meet uh, try to hoard too much of the profits and, 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 and equity at the beginning, when in the end, uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Either you're going to be super rich or incredibly rich, you know, if the company is successful. But the chances are you won't get there. So you need to use all the tools at your disposal while you can. Okay, next one. Don't count on VCs. So this is uh, a thing, especially in Silicon Valley that we startup founders run into is that they come to Silicon Valley and they're coming for the cash. And they are like, they're totally focused on fundraising. But I will tell you the cash 
doesn't come easily. It seems like it, there's too much cash out there, and there is. There, I mean, the, uh, the, it's never been easier to raise venture capital than it is right now. I mean, money is just flooding in the Silicon Valley and, and other startup hubs around the world. However, um, until you figure it out, most venture capitalists will not invest. The word venture capitalist is a little misleading because most of them aren't that adventurous. They, they want a sure thing. They want to, yes, they want a big return, but they want to minimize the risk. They want to de-risk the investment. So they want you to come to them with proof. And proof means you have to be able to run a while to figure things out, to gather data in advance of going to them. This is usually six months to a year. You know, most startups, it, it just doesn't happen overnight. They don't walk in with uh, an investor deck, put it up there and, and walk away with millions. They have to do a lot of hard work first. So um, my thing is you should be in the mind frame. We, you should pick an idea that you can go easily a year on with the money that you have now in your bank account. And your team is dedicated. You're going to iterate on it. You're going to figure it out. And then you're going to go out and raise money. Another thing I tell entrepreneurs is always be honest with investors. The truth works. Now, this is really, uh, is, you know, a lot of people think you have to, you know, sugarcoat it. You have to tell investors what they want to hear or you're never going to get them to commit. But there's a story of an entrepreneur out there uh, that, that I've met and he took a totally different approach. He actually, instead of telling investors what they wanted to hear, he decided he's just going to be completely honest with them about his business. So he walks into venture capitalists and he's like, this is my business. And he spends a, 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 the first half of his presentation talking about all the reasons they should invest. And then he spends the second half of his presentation honestly going over all the problems he sees with his business. You know, almost nobody does this. He's going over like, we have this problem. We have that problem. You know, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And by the time he's done, he raises the capital. Like it's in the investors, you know, told him, you know, we invest in you because you're totally honest with us and we just don't get that. Like, you know, we felt like we really could trust you and we really knew and understood your business. Later, his company was growing and growing, but they ran into problems and uh, they wanted to sell because, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, they, they thought they could do better by exiting rather than going all the way to an IPO. And Disney came along and Disney was interested in, in them. And they were talking with Disney and he did the same thing. He went through honestly, like, you know, these are the great things that we've built. This is how well our business is doing, but we also have these growth problems and these other things we're still dealing with, just totally honest with Disney. And then Disney acquired them. So the, the moral of the story is it pays to be honest. Money is time. So, I've known entrepreneurs out there who were so obsessed with their valuation that they literally uh, squandered valuable time. Now, we all want to get a good valuation. Why not? Like, it, you know, that's money in our pocket in the future, but only if we're successful. Valuation doesn't matter if you're not successful. One entrepreneur I knew, he came to me, he was in founder space, brilliant guy, had already been successful, sold a company, you know, had a great team. But at this, for his new company, all he had was the team and the, and the PowerPoint. That's it. And uh, it was beautifully thought out and done. And then he said, you know, we're going to be raising money at a, tw at a 25 million uh, valuation. And I was like, 25 million? Like, you're crazy. Like, it, you know, you're lucky to get one fifth that. Like it's, you're just too early. And, but he was so good that I figured he would learn. So I introduced him to a bunch of investors, all of the investors, like they loved what he had, but they all told him, look, you know, that's too high. He was stubborn. He says, I'm going to get this valuation. A year and a half later, he finally raised money at the original valuation. I told him not at his 25 million valuation, he raised money and um, he had wasted a year and a half. And that, and honestly, I haven't tracked him, but that cost him dearly because in that time, his idea that was revolutionary was now common. And, you know, timing is so important. Do not make the mistake. Take, in order to save time, if a deal is adequate, take it. Don't look for the best deal. Do more with less. 
it's really important in early stage startups, if you're going to survive, is not to waste the capital you get. Yes, it's great to raise a lot of capital, but don't do what WeWork did and just start bleeding money uh, because it seems like there's an endless supply. Uh, this, that is not a good strategy. You need to be wise with every penny. And you know, the really good entrepreneurs I know are pretty frugal at the end of the day. They're really watching money. They're not counting pennies because uh, they want to be, uh, but they are being very strategic with their money. And honestly, most companies I know spend most of their money on two things. Number one, quality employees. Really, they pay more for the best. Like count, they don't, they don't cheap out and go for, uh, they, get, they hire less people, but higher quality. Number two, customer acquisition. They just spend on growth. Remember that those are where your money should go. If it's going into rent, fancy offices, you know, meals for everybody. Honestly, I think you, you could be smarter with that money. Stick with your plan. Should you stick with your plan? That simple answer is no, because you are constantly learning. You are constantly getting new data and you always need to be rewriting your plan. So keep your plan simple. You don't need like 50 pages of business plan. Keep it very simple. Um, very uh, to the point and literally review your plan every two weeks, every two weeks to make sure you're on the right path. Try something different. Honestly, you know, in order to succeed, there are only two ways to succeed. Only two ways for a startup to succeed. Number one, you either have to be not just a little better, not incrementally better than your competition, but exponentially. You need to be like, so you need to be an order magnitude better because nobody's going to switch to your product if it's just a little better. There's a huge amount of inertia. Nobody cares. It's a lot of work to switch. The only other way uh, to win is to be different. And by different, I mean creating a value for your customer that they aren't getting from existing products. So they may continue to use existing products, but you give them, you go very deep and offer them a lot of value that they just can't get from any other product on the market. And if you can't do one of those two things, give it up and go for a new idea. Tech won't save you. You know, I don't care how great your technology is. I don't care how many years. I've had entrepreneurs come to me and say they've spent seven years developing their technology. And I'm like, well, what is the product? Like, what, what, what are you selling the customer? Because customers don't care about your technology. They only care about what you can do for them. Remember this, it's a golden rule. Discover demand, really important. Your job as an entrepreneur isn't to, uh, isn't to build the best product in the world. It isn't to raise as much money as you can in the world. It isn't to get all the publicity in the world. Your first job is to really go out there and figure out where there's demand. It doesn't matter if you build the best product in the world, but there's no demand. Like it could be perfectly built product, but no demand, you have nothing. But if you find demand that isn't being met by the market, untapped demand, and you build a product to meet that demand, you are almost sure to succeed. Like I tell entrepreneurs, they are like oil, uh, you know, in the oil fields, they have what are called wildcatters. People go up there and start drilling wells, trying to find, you know, a gusher where the oil sp spews out and they'll drill like 50 wells and then hit, hit a gusher. Um, your job is to go out there and start drilling wells and try to find where there's a pent up demand that will just come gushing out and power your business and turn it into a unicorn. If you get stuck at any point in your endeavor, like, you know, if you have any questions, like you're, you've hit a roadblock, your product sales has leveled off, you know, things aren't going the way you have planned, go talk to your customers. They have the answers, literally. Um, you know, ask them why they aren't using your product. You should be in a constant dialogue with your customers. You know, what could you do better? All of these things. Your customers will never tell you what product to build but they can tell you where your product has problems and you can, and they can tell you what demand they have, what they aren't getting that they need. And when you know that demand, again, you can build a product to meet it. It takes strength and endurance. I will reiterate this again. If you are going to survive as a startup, you have to be in it for the long haul. 
you know, I've done so many companies myself. I've mentored and, you know, funded hundreds of startups around the world. And, you know, every time, uh, like I've done my own company, I've been on the floor at some point, hopeless. But the only thing that, that led me to where I am today is that I just get up and keep going. So I just want to remind you that, like, no matter how bad it seems, just pick yourself up. Don't think about the pain. You know, you're, remember that the, every time you get back up, you become stronger. So that's critical to success. And then the yin and yang. This is uh, Eastern philosophy. I truly believe that all things in the world are a mixture of good and bad. There is always a light side and a dark side. And with startups, it's true. You know, you're going to put everything on the line. You may be risking your life savings. You may be risking relationships. Uh, and, and, you know, there's that. And then there's the good side. And it's really important for you to balance them out and to spend time with your family, spend time on relationship. You cannot do this just by working hard. I like to tell entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter how hard you work if you're falling apart. Like if inside you are not happy and you will be making bad decisions and you're stressed out, all of these things, it doesn't matter. Working hard will actually hurt your business. Also, it doesn't matter how hard you work if you're working on the wrong things. And often when you get stressed out, when you're, uh, when you're not happy, you end up making bad decisions. So balance your life out. Uh, I will end on the note, life is an adventure and you should treat it like one. Don't expect everything to, uh, you know, whenever you hit an obstacle, whenever you hit a roadblock, look at that roadblock as a challenge, not something, not a negative thing. Oh my God, everything's falling apart. No, oh my God, everything's falling apart. How can we fix it? This is a real challenge. Our whole team has to get together. We have to overcome this obstacle. If you can keep that positive attitude that it's an adventure and all the things that go wrong, all the dead ends you hit, those are part of the fun, part of winning, it's part of the game, then you will be much better off. So um, in conclusion, if you want to reach out to me for any reason, uh, go to Founders Space right up there. Um, I'm also on all the social networks. So, you you know, I'm on Clubhouse now. If you want to go follow me, just search for Founder Space on Clubhouse, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm there. Um, I love to engage uh, with entrepreneurs all over the world. And, that, you know, I hope to come meet you in person someday. So I will stop here. And we'll go back to interaction. When thank you, second. thank you, thank you, Steve. And you know, you know what we will do? We are going to uh, start this acceleration program. And when we come to the final pitching, right? We will get you invited to one of the pitches to advise the f uh, founders on, you know, wonderful. Uh, what's wrong with their pitch and so on? So we have <laughs> we have some very very interesting questions that have come up in the chat box. Here I'm going to take them one after the other. Um, most of them, you know are relating to uh, the teams uh, which you which you emphasized on. Uh, so let me start with the first question. Okay, so the first question that comes from Desi Germans in Frankfurt is, at what point is your business no longer considered a startup? In today's world, I almost say never. And I'll tell you why. Because there's always somebody uh, on your tail. Like technology is, is accelerating, the innovation is accelerating faster than ever. There's new technologies coming out literally every week. And a lot of them could seriously impact your business. So within even a big company, uh, you're going to have to be thinking like a startup and you're going to have to be innovating because somebody's going to eat your lunch. Like right? if you aren't, you're going to miss out on the next big opportunity. So I say always treat your business like a startup. Now, if you want to know what the definition, the socially uh, agreed upon definition is usually uh, when a company goes public, they are no longer a startup because they went public. Um, when they're acquired by a big company, they're no longer a startup. Uh, but um, I'll leave it there. That, that's the answer for you. No, that, that, that's a nice answer. That's a nice answer because, you know, even, even if you're no longer a startup, you should not forget your startup mentality. And that's uh, the innovation piece that should continue Okay, with you. So there is a second question from Nevruti Gajbhare of India. When should a startup think of going to VCs? So 
I tell people don't go to VCs right away. Like don't uh, waste their time and don't waste your time. Uh, go to VCs when you have when you have proof that your hypothesis is is can be validated. So VCs, it doesn't have to be you have you know millions of users or uh, lots of paying customers. It can be the proof can be uh, that you've got. Let's say you're selling B two B, a big uh, other companies, and you've lined up five major customers, and they have so, two of them have written you advance checks to get your product, and the other two have signed letters of intent. That's a great time to go to VCs because you have. And if there's enough other customers like that out there in the world, they're going to be excited. Uh, another time is if you have a consumer product. And literally, you have uh, put up something on Indiegogo or Kickstarter, and it's generated a lot of buzz and a lot of money's coming in. A great time to go. Or you can run your own private uh, to gather data. You can put up a web page. You can, uh, nobody would know that this web page exists except that you target using Facebook or Google AdWords, you target users and drive them into that page, the exact demographic that you want into, into that page. And on that page, you don't have to have a completed product. You can have pictures, you can have a description, you could have a video showing what your product is like and you have a buy button. And you measure what percentage of people click on that buy button. When they click on the buy button, of course, they can't buy it. You haven't built it, but you have a little email uh, form and say, let us, you know, we'll let you know when the product is available. Enter your email address. So you get metrics on these. You go to investors and you say, look, you know, 20% of the people we drove in clicked on this. They, there is a need for this product. Simple things like that. Great. So the, 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 the second question is the one which I very often get. And how do we give information to VCs so that they don't disclose it to other entrepreneurs and other investors? Well, I get this question all the time, too. <laughs> so, you know, venture capitalists uh, in general will not sign NDAs, at least here in Silicon Valley. And the reason is, is kind of obvious. They don't, they're getting hundreds of pitches a year. Like at Founderspace, we get thousands of submissions, you know. Uh, to our incubators and accelerators. And literally, we can't guarantee that somebody else who submitted uh, didn't have some of the same ideas you did. And we don't want to be accused of having handed your ideas to them when we never do that, right? But you know, you might think we did because you submitted and you see them take off later and they were part of our program. So uh, most people won't. My answer to you is don't worry about NDAs. Don't worry about secrecy. That's the chance of somebody ripping you off and that being the reason you fail is this big. Like it happens, right? But it doesn't happen that often. The chance of you failing because you fail to execute and move quickly is enormous. It might be this big. So this risk versus this risk, which matters? The big risk is that you do not iterate fast enough, learn enough, get to market fast enough. That is the risk of failure not the other players. They'll, they'll end up killing themselves. Um, uh, you know, Most of them can't execute. Most people fail in the execution phase. So what I'm telling you is that if you start trying to hide your idea, if you start trying to protect it and you don't go out into the world with it, to customers, to venture capitalists, to strategic partners, if you're so protected, you will stagnate. You will not make progress and you will surely, the competitors will beat you. So there's, there's a very interesting question comes from my dear friend Sudhir Kale in Australia. So his question is, since you work with people from different cultures all over the world, are there any culture specific idiosyncrasies that you've observed when it comes to startup founders? Oh, so, uh, you know, every culture is different and you always run into the problem of stereotyping because, you know, when you're comparing different cultures, like, you know, Chinese or Japanese versus uh, Americans versus Europeans versus you know Indians. You, there is always a danger uh, that you uh, will overgeneralize. But I will take that risk <laughs> since you asked me the question. So I generally see in Asian cultures um, a really strong work ethic. Like really, people uh, are committed to working long hours. Uh, I tend I tend to see in the structure of companies more hierarchical. Like the boss says this and you do this and it's really a top-down mentality. Of course, there are always exceptions to these rules. 
um, but that's just generally what I see. Um, in, uh, in Silicon Valley, the beautiful thing about Silicon Valley is it's a blend of all the cultures of the world. Like, and you have people from all these different backgrounds having to learn to communicate and cooperate together. And uh, that creates a much more egalitarian uh, system, a much more open system where people speak their mind they, and they're used to speaking their mind. There isn't uh, the complexity of, of deep homogenous cultures, like when you go to Japan or South Korea or China or India that have thousands of years of you know, coded ways of speaking and, 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 and ways of behaving. You know, in America, we all take people more on a surface level because we don't know their backgrounds. So we have to do that. So it's very different. Um, and then in Europe, uh, there are a lot of great European startups. Europeans tend to be very thoughtful, uh, very analytical, but they tend not to move as fast like as Silicon Valley or as, uh, in Asia, like they're moving like at hyper speed. Um, so, uh, they tend to be slower to move. And that, again, that's a generalization, but those are kind of a few of the differences I've observed. Yeah, so now, now there are a spate of questions on team because I think you emphasized a lot on team. So, you know, the first question comes up from Sachin Patil. Uh, one of the things we are looking for is to attract senior industry leaders to be part of our new startup. Any pointers on how to bring these folks on board? So first of all, that's great that you're doing that early. Um, as I said, it's really important to bring them onto your team, either as advisors or maybe as part of your core team, it depends. Um, you need for them ultimately to be interested is, you know, people are much more interested in startups today than they used to be. Like you go back 20 years ago, somebody in a big corporation, vice president would say, nah, you know, I'm not gonna waste my time. Um, but today, like everybody in a corporation has startup envy. So they're already primed to want to be part of your startup uh, in one way or another. They want to be part of it. It's exciting. So what you really need to, all you need to do is show them two things. One, uh, the opportunity. What is the opportunity you're going after? And why, you know, why does it matter? And then number two, yourself, your team. Who are you? Do, do they uh, respect you? Do, do, do they think you bring something special to it? Do they think you can succeed? If you can... Uh, convince them of those two things that they're real, Agreed. you will have no problem getting them. Agreed. The next, next, next oh. question is about the mentors. You know, how do you, how do you identify the right mentor for your type of startup? Are, are there any specific types of mentors for specific type of startups? That is a question from Rajendra Tupe. Okay. So Prashant, you need to mute your microphone. Prashant. <laughs> <laughs> Prashant, Prash, I'm, I'm muting him. I'm muting yeah, yeah, yeah. him. Okay, good. Yeah, Let's go, go ahead. I muted so, Prashant. So what was the question again? I got distracted. Let's repeat that. Yeah, the question is, how do you find the right mentor? You know, are there any oh, specific yeah. types of mentors for a specific type of startups so, or yeah, there's one size that fits all? There are many different types of mentors. So some mentors are generalists and they are really good because they've done a lot of different things um, and they can kind of advise you. Some mentors are more emotional mentors. Like a lot of doing a startup isn't just like facts and knowledge, it's actually getting the emotional support you need, somebody to listen to you, somebody to advise you on, on you know, issues with employees and things like that. Other mentors are those who uh, are domain experts. And these are really important mentors and they have to uh, be really, the deeper they are in their field, the better off for you. You have to remember that a lot of domain experts though get locked into thinking. Like they, they have so much knowledge that they think things are impossible because they have never seen it done. That doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it hasn't been done, especially with new technology. It may well be possible, but they get locked in. So you can't listen to everything your mentors say. Now, an interesting thing is in Founderspace, we have experimented with mentorship. And we used to, at the beginning, assign mentors to startups. But what we found out is it doesn't work that well because some mentors aren't interested in that startup. They just, for whatever reason, we thought they would be, but they aren't. And sometimes the entrepreneur isn't interested in the mentor. They think they're not qualified or really a lot of it is just how they communicate. And some people just don't connect. There's not that a deep a level of communication um, and there's no magic there. So instead, uh, in Founderspace, what we have begun, what we started to do, and it worked really well, was we 
have mentor, we have kind of uh, musical chairs. So we invite in like 20 mentors and we have 20 startups and, or 10 startups, it doesn't matter. And the mentors go from startup to startup to startup, uh, spending a short time with each, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, getting to know them, getting to know their uh, company, and then they move to the next one. So it's like inner, it's like speed dating, right? <laughs> for, for mentors. And, and then the, we let the both sides decide which ones they want to work with, you know? And they get, they get to pick. And th that produces uh, much deeper and longer lasting relationships. So that, my, that, my that, answer to you is talk to a lot of mentors, right? right? Like talk to a lot, don't just focus on a few and find out which are natural fits for you. Sandeep, that's a great input uh, for us, uh, you know, when we can do mentor dating and let the startup yeah. find the right. Yeah, answer. yeah. And, and the mentors like it too, and the startups like it. Yeah. They do that in Alchemist Accelerator all the time. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, so. And we have, we have somebody from Alchemist Accelerator also on this call today. So, but uh, now coming uh, to the other question, you know, I'm going to club these two questions. One is from Suresh Sormare and other is from Amul Borde. Uh, what should you consider by hiring your initial employees and how do you handle the challenge of employee retention? So uh, first of all, you can, don't hire fast, like take your time and never compromise. Like every time I've compromised on a hire, I almost always regret it. Because whatever <laughs> I saw at the beginning that, what, that was kind of the red flag that I overlooked because I was under pressure to get somebody on board turns out to be, it, 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 it turns out to be true and, and it doesn't work out. And remember, the, it might seem like you're spending a huge amount of time uh, vetting employees, interviewing them, searching resumes, but once you bring somebody on, you're going to spend even more time getting them up to speed, integrating them with your team. And if, and if you didn't make the right pick, it's not going to work out. So uh, literally, uh, be super picky, only hire the best. In a startup, you don't, you don't have a lot of time. You need, to, you need to get the best people. The really great companies out there are very strict about their hiring. And they use objective standards. They have like, they multiple people on the team interview every employee and they have a system for grading the employees. And instead of people just saying their opinion, they actually grade them on specific criteria. Like, are they good in, uh, do they have the, the skill set we need? You know, what's their personality like? All these different criteria. And then uh, they, uh, they add up the numbers from all the different people who have interviewed them and go by the numbers. And that actually works better than a gut feeling because our gut feelings are often misleading. Uh, we all have biases built in uh, that, that often ignore what, what we're really perceiving. So being more analytical is really important. And then you will always make mistakes. And if you make mistakes, literally uh, fire fast. Like I give a whole talk on this. Like you, um, you know, the second you realize somebody isn't working out, most people will give them a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, you know, and a, it's six months go by and they still haven't let the person go and they just wasted six months. And honestly, you can't afford to do that as a startup. You just, you, you, we all make mistakes. You just have to admit it. I'm not saying be mean to the person, be honest with them, why you made the decision and then let them go. So we are at the top of the hour. We have mm -hmm. to wrap up this session. Uh, one last question I'm going to take because it comes from a very dear friend of mine, Nyani Palne Kumar, who is also a mentor at Alchemist Accelerator and an investor in his own right. What is the one thing founders should do to get your attention in their first meeting? Ah, the one thing they should do is not just talk, but actually it's not true for me. It's true for everybody, but let's engage in a dialogue, like not a one-way uh, conversation where they're just talking, 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 talking. Let's engage in a dialogue about your business. Uh, uh, answer questions honestly. Uh, go, uh, go. Uh, you know, let's let's be flexible. Don't just stick to the PowerPoint. That those are really important things. And tell and really go deep on your business. I want to understand what it is about this business that you know what what inside. Uh, secrets, what inside knowledge you have that most other people don't see. And, and that's what I want to walk away with. Because if I can feel that there's something there, we'll have another meeting after that. 
That 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 is amazing, uh, Steve. So I think we I know we, the questions could keep coming in, and uh, you know we could keep going, but you know we have to wrap up because people have other schedules. So yep. thank you so much for uh, you know making uh, this session, and uh, you know. Uh, accepting our invitation to be here to talk to our people here. We will certainly invite you one more time, you know, when we are uh, doing our accelerator yes, yes. program. Yes, yes. Wonderful. And, you know, so we, we, I think this was a good warm up, right, Anand, to get us started. And because Absolutely. we have a session in the evening, yes. we, have, we are briefing our mentors on how to do mentoring and so on. And one of the things that you spoke about, ask, don't tell, you know, is very true because last night when I was making the slide, <laughs> I said, don't be prescriptive, be supportive. Okay, it's just very important, you know, you just don't want to tell them this is right, this is wrong. Good, we're thinking this. along the same yeah. lines. So I think, yeah. And, and I want to reach out to all your members globally and say, I'm traveling the world now. Right. So, um, you know, if something comes up in your city, uh, let me know. I may yeah. be there and maybe we can connect and, and collaborate. Yeah, and you can you can you can share the code for your book that can help us uh, get some discounts. Oh the yes, book for our, oh, for yeah, our members sure. who are here. Yeah, that'll so, be nice. Okay, so tell Naobi to send the code to me. I will send it. Uh, I'll, to I'll just then... tell people you can okay. go to founderspace.com okay. slash promo p r o m o founderspace.com slash promo, and you'll get. It's a really amazing thing because we offer a lot of videos and other material. Thanks a lot. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I can't wait to meet you in person, all of you. Bye Take bye. care. With your permission, I end the meeting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Bye.